All right, so thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, if you haven't already, if you are a member, please type yes in the chat box, and we really appreciate that. My name is Jeremy McLaughlin. I'm the chair of the San Jose State ACES student chapter, and I'll be introducing our speakers tonight. Um, if you are not currently a member, you'll definitely want to um, pay attention to what my colleague Kate Dillon is going to talk about um, here briefly for a moment, which will be uh, the uh, benefits briefly of uh, joining our student chapter, as well as the uh, raffle that I'm sure some of you have heard about. So Kate, I'll hand it over to you. Don't forget to uh, turn on your microphone, Kate. Okay, um, I think maybe Kate might be having a technical issue, uh, so I'll jump in to just say um, uh, being part of San Jose State ACES student chapters opened up a lot of great opportunities for me. Uh, this event tonight is the sort of bookend of our membership drive, which has been going on all week. Um, we've been talking with folks about sort of the benefits of joining our student chapter, some of the um, uh, ways that you can get involved with our executive committee, um, as well as helping out with events like this. Uh, if you check out our homepage, we have a great Prezi that was created by uh, Suzanne Rogers Gruber, who was our previous chair. And so please go there, see some of the benefits, um, check out how you can get involved, as well as uh, how you can become a member. Um, I will also ask if you uh, do not. Uh, currently, if you are a member, or sorry, if you're a student at San Jose State and you're not currently a member of ACES and would like to enter our raffle, please type your first and last name in the chat box now, and um, we will be taking notes of those names. And at the end, um, Kate or myself, depending on if uh, Kate's microphone is working, we will uh, do the drawing. And oh, I heard you for a second there, Kate. We will uh, do the drawing at the end after the uh, the speakers. So please, uh, oh, sorry to hear your audio went out, Kate. But um, we're gonna we have the names going in for the uh, raffle right now. So you and Marissa can take those, and um, we will be holding that drawing after the speakers this evening. So with that, I am very excited to uh, introduce our session tonight, How the Hiring Process Really Works, An Insider's Guide to Getting the Job. And I'm really excited to introduce our speakers, Beth Anderson Shook and Sam Leaf. Uh, Beth received her Master's in Library Science from Indiana University, and I had the pleasure of meeting her and working with her during her tenure as Associate University Librarian at Northern Arizona University. She's currently the Library Director for the College of Southern Nevada and has experience with coaching, HR issues, hiring, um, and if you're interested in that sort of thing, she also knows some great places to hike around Flagstaff and uh, Vegas. So uh, there you go. <laughs> Sam Leaf is the Library Director for the Colorado Department of Corrections and is a graduate of the San Jose State University SLIS, now the iSchool, where she was very active in the ALA student chapter. Sam also has experience hiring, training, and mentoring staff, and in addition to her work, she um, also remains very involved with ALA and helping to mentor new librarians. So both of our speakers tonight have experience on both sides of the interviewing table. I'm really excited to have them with us, and I'd like to thank them. And uh, with that, I officially hand it over to Beth and Sam. Thanks. All right, well, so, uh, this is Sam, and I just wanted to basically welcome you guys all here and thank you guys all for coming. Beth and I really hope that we have some insider info to share with you, and uh, you guys can take something really great away from this. So I'm going to hand it right over to Beth. All right, it's great to be here. This is Beth, and I just wanted to let everyone know that please do ask questions using the chat and we will either answer those as we go or um, answer them at the end. So you'll have plenty of chance to ask questions. Um, Sam and I will do our best to answer them. Um, again, you know, uh, we just are so glad to be able to support uh, library science students in this pursuit of, of getting your dream job. 
um, and you really can do that, um, and we're excited in a small way to help you. So really the first part, um, and one of the most important parts of finding that dream job is getting to the interview stage. Um, I'm sure some of you may be aware that um, the job market right now, many, many positions um, in the library science world will get 100 applications, um, maybe even more than that, depending on the location and the type of job. And so we're going to give you some tips um, that we felt would really help you, your application um, rise to the top of that, what might be a very large stack. Um, first of all, really take time with your cover letter. Um, customize it to each position that you choose to apply for. I know when you're getting to the end of your degree, uh, there's a lot of opportunities. You're looking at a lot of positions. You're, you're maybe sending out a lot of applications, but it is really worth it to customize that letter. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, don't, you can use a form letter, but I really urge you to, to make it as personalized as you can um, so that you will stand out. And then make sure that your CV or your resume is completely up to date. Um, even if it's just been a few months, uh, you may have joined ACES. You may have done something else that should be on that resume, and because of, uh, how difficult and challenging the job market is, those small things um, can really make a difference. Make sure that um, if you mention something in the letter, um, I've been volunteering at a library, that that is also in your resume because the search committees will go back and forth between the resume and the letters and, and want everything to match. Um, secondly, make sure that you really Think about it from the search committee's perspective. They are reading, you know, many, many applications, and so try to give them as many details as you can so that they will be able to score you or rank you effectively. So if you were a director of a small unit, let's say you worked in circulation department, how many students did you supervise? Be really specific. Give them something so that they can give you um, more points or, or more um, uh, rankings um, so that, again, so that you won't stand out. Uh, definitely, you know, Google yourself and see if there's anything up there that um, you really wouldn't want. Uh, anyone to see, uh, especially your, your new boss or your boss's boss at a new organization. People really do do this. Search committees will Google. They'll see and look at everything that's open. So if you haven't locked down your Facebook um, or there's something out there, you know, see if you can remove it if it's something that you really don't think um, would help you. Um, also, again, you know, join organizations so that you can include them. You know, go ahead and join ALA or your state library association. Join ACES. Join the student groups that are available to you. It, it really does help. And it shows that you're really investing in yourself, I think. Um, the last piece of advice is kind of a, a, a no, don't do this. Don't apply to positions that you don't really want. Um, I know it's a tough job market, but if you're really, you know, not excited about it, that's probably going to come through in the application, um, and there's no sense in, in um, trying to exaggerate or, or do something that um, really isn't what you, what you hope to do. So landing the interview is, is really, um, again, part of this. Um, look carefully at the job posting, especially the uh, requireds and preferreds, and respond to each and every one of those. Um, there's a reason why those are in the job posting. And again, the search committees are going to be ranking you on all of those things.
for sure. All of those things. Um, and so knowing going in, they're going to look and see if I have academic library experience because that is a preferred quality. If you do have it, put it in there and be ex as explicit as possible. Um, if you don't have something that they're looking for, um, you know, it's it's not a bad, if it's a preferred qualification, you can always say, I'm really, I don't have a lot of experience with um, writing grants, but I plan on, you know, taking a webinar, I plan on, you know, learning that, I know how important that is in the library world. Um, I have written this type of document that might be applicable. So give the search committee something to work with um, so that they can give you some points and maybe you'll get that interview. Um, definitely um, give them enough information so that they can assess you compared to the other um, applicants. You want to give yourself, um, you know, the most possible chance and um, giving them more information without being overly long, I think, is that, that great middle ground you're trying to find. If you have online projects um, from library school, uh, include a link um, in, your, in your materials. Um, I think that uh, definitely can show the search committee um, what type of a projects you've done and, and how you pull together projects. It can show them how well you write, which is often communication skills are often a, a job requirement. It can show them design skills, um, a whole variety of things. So, so think carefully about that. All right, so here's what not to now do. Sam's gonna first of all, what surprised me when to, to I avoid. sat on the other side of the table for the first time and did some hiring is that a lot of times the first step doesn't even look at your documents. I remember um, I was in a meeting with the, what we call subject matter experts, or the people that review these applications. And they were flipping through, and they're like, OK, well, they don't list anything about uh, whatever it was. Um, you know, they don't have two years of full-time library experience that we require. And I said, well, wait a minute. If you look in their uh, application, if you look in their, their CV, they list it right there. Well, they didn't list it on this question here that says detail your two years of library experience. They were going to throw out this application and not even look at the resume or cover letter that was submitted with it. And so do make sure that you're paying attention to the responses to the questions in the application itself, because sometimes they never even get to your CV or resume where you're covering that sort of thing. Um, also, answer those questions concisely, but Answer them as carefully as you construct your cover letter or your resume. Because again, a lot of times they'll even say, uh, especially in government and state jobs, the answers here will be used to rank you. Believe it, they really will be. And so you want to craft those answers very, very carefully. And you want to answer them completely. For example, in my current position, we ask a question about writing experience, and we say, List examples of when you've used or written blogs, memos, technical reports. And we'll have people who write things like, well, I've been in the library world for 20 years, and I've written lots of things. That's, that's not really what we asked for. Give an example. And so try to answer the question as accurately and as completely as you can, because those are really, really important. Obviously, we talked a little bit about customizing your CV, resume, and cover letter. And then make sure you send it to the correct place. There's nothing more embarrassing than sending someone a resume or cover letter addressed to someone else. And it's kind of hard to crawl out of that, that hole. So do double check your documentation and make sure that you're sending it to the right people at the right place. Um, we talked a little bit about including details in your application pro uh, process. And those are great if they're relevant. I don't care how many followers you have on Instagram. But I do care how many followers the library got on Instagram once you took over the feed. If you increased it by 100%, that's something I want to know. And we also talked a little bit, employers will Google you. They'll search for your Facebook, your LinkedIn, and other social networking sites. So be prepared for that. And one of the ways that I know that a lot of new graduates are preparing for that is by creating a separate professional presence on certain networking sites and then having their personal ones kind of hidden 
so that when somebody goes to do a Google search for you, they find sort of this top layer of information, and they don't dig too much farther past that. And so that may be a strategy that some of you may choose to employ. And then make sure you're active in the organizations that you say you are. Another little horror story from my experience, I had a person say that they were active in uh, the GLBT Roundtable Buddy Program, and I have a very good friend who helps coordinate that program, and so I asked him about this person, and he had never, ever heard of them. They had never signed up to be either a mentor or a buddy. They've, they've never been involved in it that he could find. And so that was kind of telling that somebody might embellish a little bit. And so be very careful because the library world is very small. So if you say, I'm a member of the organization, that's fine. If you say you're active in it, make sure that you are. Great, Sam. Those are some great uh, suggestions, and I think um, all true in my experience. And we've de I've definitely seen cover letters that were uh, addressed to the wrong person. Um, I've seen people mention the wrong job in a cover letter. So say I'm, I'm interested in applying for the reference librarian position, and we were hiring a technical services librarian. Um, so really taking those extra steps um, we'll make sure that you're successful. So hopefully you will land some interviews and um, we've, we've got some advice on how to get ready for that interview day. Um, I think it's really, it sounds really basic, but research the institution or the organization. Um, get on their website, um, figure out if you can who who is on the selection committee? Who's on that hiring committee? Who are you going to be meeting with? Um, I think you can really uh, score points on the interview day if you um, introduce yourself uh, at the interview and say, wow, you know, um, it's great to meet you, Jeremy. I, I follow your blog. You know, or I was impressed to see what you put on your blog. Um, then they know that you're really interested in that job and that organization. It won't take too much time. You can just poke around a little bit and, and take some notes and, and then look around and see what else um, you might want to mention. Um, see what you can. Look at the if there is a news feed on the library website or on the organization website, see if you can find out, you know, what have they been doing? What can you find out anything about, um, do they have a Facebook page? How long have they had it? Um, what kinds of things do they post there? Um, is that not allowed? Um, you know, you want to try to customize um, your preparation to the culture that you're coming into, and knowing takes a little bit of effort to, to poke around and find those things. Um, and then going back to the job advertisement, the job posting, you can pretty much be guaranteed that they're going to ask you a question about each of the required and preferred uh, skills and abilities that were in that job posting. Uh, think about what that might be if they ask for experience um, creating online library guides for, to support students. Well, think about what they might ask, and, and then think about how you might answer. Um, what, what have you done if you haven't ever had the chance to do that? But what have you done in school or in volunteer or on a committee or in a previous job? Or what have you done that might um, resonate with the committee and show them that you could do this, um, you just haven't had the opportunity yet? Really have those examples ready. Uh, and you can't be a mind reader, uh, but you can really, I think, be, be prepared so that you don't have that, that experience of not having an answer um, when you get in that, um, that interview situation. Now Sam's going to talk a little bit more about um, preparation. All right. Um, one of the biggest tips that I can really give to people is to keep a lot log of the jobs that you apply to. Keep links to the institutions, callbacks, interviews, make notes of who you interacted with so that you can remember if you talk to them again. And one of the biggest things is to save the job posting as like a PDF or something like that to your computer so that you can refer back to it as you prepare for the interview. Because usually by that time they've taken it off the internet. And so you want to have a version that you can refer to and you can really be very prepared for. Um, 
for research in the institution, she mentioned it a little bit, you know, check their Facebook, check their Twitter. Also check things like their events calendar and strategic plans and missions and statistics. Don't just look at the library, look at the surrounding community. What population do they serve? If you can walk in with this great knowledge of where they want to go and what they're offering and how they're trying to change that, then you've got a one-up on the other hundreds of applicants that they've had already. So definitely do your research. Um, I can't talk more than possible about having a professional voicemail. I actually once called a person for an interview and their voicemail was left by what I assume was their boyfriend who stated that if I was a male, I should definitely not leave a voicemail or he would hunt me down. I went ahead and chose not to leave a voicemail. So definitely have a professional voicemail. Asking for the address, totally fine. Asking for specific directions on how to get there from a certain intersection, not so good. Pre-print a map. Use a map app on your phone. There's options out there, but calling me and saying, hey, I'm at this, this corner here. Can you direct me to the library? That's, that's a little reaching too far. Um, sometimes things pop up in your life and you schedule an interview and now you need to reschedule. Once is okay. It's not ideal, but nobody's really going to bat an eye too much. More than once, then it seems like this job is not quite the priority that we would hope that it would be from our side of the table. And then um, as far as doing your research, that's good. Sometimes you can't find the strategic plan and you need to call and say, hey, where can I find your strategic plan? Something like that. But don't overdo it. I had an applicant who called every day for a week um, just asking random questions that she really could have found with doing her own research. And we're all librarians. Let's kind of get that out of the way, right? We are supposed to be good at research. So if you're calling me about things that you should be able to find with a little bit of research, you're not sticking in my mind for a good reason. So definitely do your homework, but do it in a thoughtful manner. And then know where you are. Keep your facts straight. Keep their identity straight. And also, start to try to understand that, that whole cultural part. How do they define themselves? Do they like to call themselves an urban campus? Do they prefer to call themselves a small school versus a large school, or a large school versus a small school? Try to reflect their language and their culture back to them so that you don't accidentally call a large school a small school or something to that effect. And I'll pass it back over to Beth. Great. Those are some great, great um, ideas, and I think I can't um, say it enough times. Um, really do your homework, because everything that Sam said is absolutely true. They are going to be looking for someone who has done that extra research, knows that gosh, um, your accreditation visit is coming up next year. I, you know, the, the college or university homepage is making a big deal out of assessment. And so I better talk about, you know, what I know about assessment. Um, because if you're not doing that, you can probably guess that someone else will. And it may be the difference between you getting that job offer um, and not. Um, so now we're going to talk just briefly about the interview day. Um, you know, Sam talked a little bit about some of these things, but really I have had folks come in and not have a clue um, what our FTE is, or full-time equivalent of students. And so they might have made some comments about, well, you're a medium-sized school, and so I'm guessing that this would work here where in reality we were a huge school, you know, um, and so the interview committee kind of, you could see them look around the table when the person made that comment because you wondered, well, why do they think that? Maybe they don't know, um, but don't, don't say something that you're not pretty certain of. Um, know if there's more than one library, if there's an architecture library and a and an art library and a main library, or different campuses have libraries. Know all those details um, so that you can work those into your interview responses. It makes a huge difference if, if you can mention just a few things um, related to this job at this point. Um, 
And then most interview days, you're going to meet with different groups. You'll probably meet with the interview, certainly with the search committee. You might meet with human resources to find out about benefits. You will probably meet with um, the library director or dean, or you might meet with the head of whoever supervises that unit. It depends. But usually they'll send you that, that interview schedule in advance. Um, and, and then think about some questions that you're going to have and have questions prepared for each group. Um, if you're going to have lunch with a, a separate group, have some questions for the lunch group. Um, this is your chance to interview them and find out if you want to work for this organization, but also they're going to expect that you're going to have questions and um, it's much better to have them written down because interviewing is a stressful um, day uh, and you're going to be tired by the end of the day and so have everything written down so that there's no mistake and so that you have get not only your questions answered but that you look really prepared. And then if something comes up that you didn't understand or brought up a concern for you, certainly take notes during the interview process. Um, there will be times for that. A lot of candidates don't do that, and then at the end of the day, they'll say, well, I know there was something I wanted to ask, but I, I didn't write it down. Um, really, it's fine to write it down. It's time to write, you know, we are spending a lot of time to interview you. Uh, we want to make sure we're answering your questions, um, and we want to make sure that and you, know, you have a chance to do that. So there's no problem with taking notes during the interview um, or, you know, having uh, a notebook so that you have all your questions there. I think it's also, in this day and age, it's really great if you have projects that um, maybe you linked out to in your resume or something that you created after you applied um, that you'd like to show, you know, either bring um, – a tablet or a computer or something, and, and you know, be, don't be shy about saying, well, I, I have an example of um, some marketing materials that I, that I did for an event. Um, would you like to see them? I mean, I think there are lots of times during the interview day when that would really uh, be appropriate. Always ask and say, would it be all right for me to show this? Um, bring a copy of, of whatever uh, documentation you might want to share with them. Um, and again, be really excited about this particular job. Um, know what it is. Know that you want this particular job. You want to be at this particular place um, and that you feel like it's the right time for you. I, I, there have been many times when I've wished that a candidate would say, you know, I'm ready to do this job. I know that I could do a terrific job. Um, you know, when we give you that chance at the end of the interview to say, is there anything else you would like to tell the committee, that is the time for you to say, I am so excited about this job at this institution at this time. Um, and there's not that many candidates that I've seen that have, that have done that. Oftentimes they'll say, no, I think I've, I've covered everything, which may be true, but they ask that question just to give you a chance to um, to really sell yourself that one last time. Um, also, it's really appropriate to ask specific questions. If you are getting an interview, you're probably one of a handful of candidates. Um, they're going to expect that you're going to want to know what really, what are the typical duties? What, what hours do most people work? Um, what kind of support is there for professional development? Um, what kind of training or travel support is there? Um, what, what is the management style of the director or of my supervisor? Um, folks in those positions are prepared to answer those questions and it shows that you really want this job and you're, you're, um, interested in, in what this, this job atmosphere is going to be like. If there's a problem with you asking about the management style of your supervisor, that might be a sign that you don't want that job um, because every director or manager should be willing to, to answer that and respond. Um, 
I I think it's awesome when candidates ask, you know, what are what are you proud of? You've got usually a chance to ask questions with the search committee, and there's going to be a variety of people on that committee. Um, some people who maybe have worked there a long time, other times people who've worked there just a short time. What are they proud of? What do they love about their job? Um, what do they like about the institution? Um, I think a great question is to ask folks what is what do they see as their big, biggest success in the library or institution? Um, because that will tell a little bit about those individuals and, and what they're working on and their motivation. Um, it, it's a, it can also, one of the challenging situations, I think, is if you are currently in a position um, that you don't enjoy uh, for whatever reason or that just is not um, working out for you. Um, I think I've seen people handle this in a lot of different ways. It's best if you can stay as positive as possible. Um, even if it is a really horrible situation, try to find some way to describe um, your current situation and stay positive um, because the search committee is going to be, if you go negative in the interview, they're going to wonder, well, gosh, I wonder, um, how they're going to feel about our institution, or I wonder if they're always a negative person. Um, and so uh, talk to other people if you, if you have any doubts before you get to the interview. What do you think I should say about this, or how might I phrase this um, so that you have it ready, um, because there probably will be at least one question about um, your current place of employment or your current boss or whatever. So think of what you can say. Um, and usually, if you do that, um, you know, we've all had positions where we weren't, for whatever reason, it wasn't a great fit or it just didn't work out for a variety of reasons. So people can relate to that, but try to stay positive if you possibly can. So Sam is going to um, tell us uh, some more great information about um, horror stories um, on the interview day. All right. So first of all, just to kind of touch base a little bit with some of the things Beth was saying, every question that, that the interviewer asks, it's, it's made to speak to something. It's carefully crafted. It's chosen from huge lists. It's identified as this is a question that we want to ask, and this is a question that we want to hear the answer to. And you always have the answers that you want to hear in your head when you ask those questions, you know kind of what you're trying to get at and what kind of a reaction you're trying to get. And one of the best uh, questions that a lot of people will ask and a lot of people struggle with are situational questions and what if questions. And it's absolutely okay to ask for a moment to consider before you answer. So you know what, can you give me just one second to sort of filter through that question? And you know, it's okay, sure, absolutely. And then answer it. And you can even answer it by saying, you know what, I haven't ever been in that specific situation. However, this is how I would handle it. Um, that's okay. What's not okay is to literally, I've, I've had so many people that literally sit there and go, well, I've never been in that situation, so I can't answer that question. Well, what if you were in that situation? Well, I never have been, so I don't know what I'd do. So now I don't know what you'd do either. And I want to know, what are you going to do? So absolutely always have an answer, even if you have to say, I'm kind of making this up. I've never been in that situation. But knowing myself, this is how I would react, because that's what we want to know. Um, one of the other things, too, don't bring friends, family, or pets to the interview. I know sometimes people say things on here, and you're like, well, obviously, who would do that? But sometimes situations arise. I had an applicant who, um, brought their father. He ended up driving her because her car broke. And so she told him, well, you know, this is a, it's a academic library. Come on in and have a seat and, you know, you don't have to sit out in the car. Except that every time we would walk by or make eye contact with him, he would wave and give a thumbs up. Like he was, you know, yeah, go for it. Hire her, you know. It was just very uncomfortable. Um, you know, send him down to the coffee shop or something like that. But don't have him right there. Um, I had another interviewer who, interviewee, sorry, who saw a friend during the interview process and he actually got up, left the table, and went to go catch up with his friend for a few minutes and then came back and was, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I just wanted to catch up. I haven't seen him in a long time. 
that's what Facebook and phones are for. That's not what an interview is for. So much like Beth was saying, you know, once you're here for an interview, you've been whittled down to a small, small group. And we're spending a lot of time. Usually these are all day, maybe even two day interviews. And to have somebody get up in the middle of that and just go talk to their friend, it, it shows that they're not really all that focused on the interview itself. Bring extra copies of your documents and something to take notes with. Um, another little horror story. I had an interviewer, interviewee ask um, for her resume back because her printer was broken and she wasn't able to make more copies for future job interviews. So not only does that show that you don't take this job very seriously, but that you can't even get yourself over to Kinko's to make copies of your documents. And so if you're going to give me something, let me keep it. I had actually flipped over her resume and had made some comments, some notes on the back. And so it was really kind of an uncomfortable situation for all of us. Um, and then to stay positive, not just about your previous workplace, but about the one that you're interviewing in. I had an applicant at the end of the interview say that they couldn't imagine why someone would choose to work in a correctional setting. Um, they said that they uh, only someone desperate would work in that setting and that they weren't there yet. But if they did get there, they'd go ahead and reapply. I'm, I'm guessing if they reapply, I probably won't give them an interview. Um, and then I had another applicant launch into ways that the library could be better. I was taking them on uh, um, a tour of the library, you know, wanting to show them where they would eventually work. And they just started talking about, you know, this place could really use a, a new coat of paint on the walls and, you know, maybe knocking down this wall over here, add a little bit more space. I do understand that you want to offer your insights and offer your opinions. But at the same time, if you do it in a negative way, as opposed to saying, oh, you know, I like how you've done this, or I like this display space that you have set up, if you're starting to talk about things like knocking walls down, you have no idea what our budget is. You have no idea what plans we might have. And so it was just kind of a really awkward way to, to, to walk through a tour with. So definitely keep uh, focus on the positives in each step of the way that you're, um, that you're going for. Uh, and then presentations. In a lot of job interviews in our field, they want presentations. And so I would just say to practice and to be passionate about whatever you're presenting about. I've certainly been on both sides of the presentation wheel. And when I'm presenting, sometimes you're given exactly what to present on. And maybe you really don't love that database all that much. But you sure need to act like it. You need to sell that database like it is the best thing that you have ever done. Whatever it is that you're presenting on, find the passion, find the energy, find the excitement, and portray that. But also, make it relevant and work in those specific statistics that you gathered in your research stage. Talk about how, I know that, you know, 27% of your incoming freshmen are interested in blank, and so that's why I know that this database can really help them you know, achieve their road to success or whatever it is, you know, use that information that, that you gathered in that presentation. It's just another way to show that you are really interested in this job. And then asking things that are odd. For example, in my current position, when I was interviewing for it, I actually lived out of state and I never met the people until I arrived for this position. They did not fly me in for a face-to-face -face interview. And so we did it all over the phone, and then we actually had a, um, like a online interview, but it didn't include a video, so it was kind of strange. So I asked them in the last step, I said, uh, you know what's interesting is if I was sitting in front of you, I wouldn't have to preface this question, but you're asking me to move to a small town that's built around a correctional facility. So I want to be very clear about this. I'm gay, and... I want to make sure that that is okay with your institutional culture and with your city because I've never been to either. And I just want to make sure that, that I would be accepted there. And there was a brief pause and I thought, oh my gosh, did I just ruin this asking this question that seems so strange. But instead they all came back with, wow, that, that was a really good question to ask because you are uprooting your life and moving to a whole new place. And you've never been here, you've never visited. And, and so it was a very interesting experience for me to be on kind of the other side of that, that heart stopping moment where you're not sure if maybe you put your foot in your mouth. But asking questions that actually will impact whether or not you want the job 
is just as important as knowing if they want you in the job. And so Beth did talk about that a little bit. You're interviewing them too. So if you have certain requirements or certain questions or certain stipulations about yourself, you want to make sure that they can meet those too. And so I do want to stress that a little bit with you guys, that it's okay to ask those kinds of questions. If they're important to you, then ask those questions. So I'll pass it back on over to Beth. Yeah, again, uh, Sam has some great points there. Definitely think carefully about what questions um, you're going to ask because you're making a huge commitment by taking this job. Um, and, you know, if, if it's not the right one, um, it is okay to turn down the job offer. I think that's something that we, we didn't actually put in the slides, but that I want to mention here. Um, some of the best advice I ever got in my career was something many, many years ago. Uh, I was offered my first professional position. Um, I had done a, a short-term visiting uh, position, and I was offered a full-time position, and I, I thought it was what I wanted, and I went and talked to someone that was serving as a reference for me, and they said, oh my gosh, you know, no, I wouldn't take that. Here's why. They had some very good reasons why. And so I turned down, down the job offer, and at the time, I couldn't imagine it because I was so thrilled to get a full-time um, tenure-track position, but the reality was um, that was the right thing to do. Um, another thing that I, that I wanted to make sure we included was when you um, put down those references um, that are required for jobs, make sure you send uh, the references the job description. Um, and as Sam mentioned, sometimes once that posting, if it's posted for 30 days or 60 days, once that period is over, they, um, the job posting may come down. So if you don't have it saved as a PDF, as she advised, um, then to send to your references, when you get to that interview stage, you're going to have to, you know, really try to recreate um, what would have been an, an easy thing. And always, always, always inform your references um, when you're applying for a position. I still serve as a reference um, for many, many people, and I'm surprised sometimes because I will get a call from a search committee uh, regarding someone that I would love to provide a good reference for, but um, I always appreciate being informed, hey, would you be willing to continue to serve as a reference for me in, in, in this particular position? Um, so that's another side of the interview process that's super important. Um, identify really great references and then make sure to keep them in the loop as you apply for positions, and especially if you get to that interview stage because they'll probably be calling the references. Um, post interviews, make sure you do send thank yous. Um, it's important to do that as soon as possible because oftentimes um, that search committee will be making a decision um, very, very quickly within the next few days. Um, and so if you want them to have an impact, you need to send them really quickly. Um, if you didn't get the offer and you felt like the interview went really well, um, it is okay to contact the search committee chair or perhaps the dean or director of the library to see if there's any advice that they could give you um, or talk with you a little bit. Sometimes um, folks may not be willing to do that, um, but oftentimes they will be. They want to mentor people and they want to help um, you to do better next time. And so there might be some small things that they could say, you know, get some experience in this area or maybe, you know, something um, about how you interviewed or how your presentation went that, that could be helpful. Um, again, we've already mentioned this, but the library world is really small. So um, if you can, positive possibly not go negative about any individuals um, or any institutions or library or library school. Um, I've heard people say really negative things about all three of those. Uh, and it didn't make me, and in one case, I knew one of the people they were talking about, and it just really didn't make me feel very good uh, about them as a, as a future colleague. So, um, And then uh, another idea is to really Try as much as possible to stay professional. If you are, if you volunteer for a committee, then follow through on your commitment. If you go to conferences, you know, um, 
folks who are in the hiring business are usually always in the hiring business. We're always thinking about that next position that might be vacant. And so I will be honest, when I go to ALA and ACRL, I am taking notes of, of young professionals or, or newer librarians who, um, who stand out and who are participating in meetings. I will oftentimes jot down names uh, and keep those so that I know of a pool of people um, that impressed me. And so be impressive when you're in those work situations. Uh, we wanted to offer, um, so that's all of our formal presentation, but we really wanted to offer a chance for folks to ask questions. Um, we just loved uh, getting this opportunity to speak to you and hopefully to help you as you go through the application and interview process, but we're, I'm sure we, we neglected to talk about some things, so if there are any questions, um, please um, put them in the chat box. Um, we also have our contact information up um, on the screen, and so we'd be welcome, we'd be more than happy to answer any future questions um, if you think of something tomorrow. Um, uh, you definitely can email us, and we'll do our best to, to respond. Hey, Beth, Sam, it's Jeremy. Um, that was some great information. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned at the start the competitiveness of the market. Um, I was just curious what your thoughts were, um, given how much you said about applying for the right job and the job that's for you. And I'm just going to say this honestly. How about dumbing down your qualifications a little bit or, you know, any, any thoughts about that, sort of that side of it? Because if it is so competitive, I know sometimes you see positions out there and you think, oh, you know, I'm a little overqualified and you may be desperate or maybe you're not, you know, so how would you suggest sort of handling that aspect of it? Sam, do you want to take that or? Yeah, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I think that one of the best comments that I can give you on that is to remember that personalize everything and you don't have to include everything. Include what's relevant to the job that you're applying for but don't include everything that you've ever done. And so that may help you kind of balance that including too much or seeming overqualified if you're really paring down into just what they're, they're really focused on. Look at that job ad, really address what they want to see, and kind of leave the rest for, uh, for them to discover. Beth, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think also, you know, do a good job in, the, in that situation. I would really make sure in the cover letter you had something in there about why do I want this job? Is it, you know, um, I've had people talk about wanting to relocate um, because of personal reasons, and that really is okay to say because it sometimes can explain, you know, why someone who has been doing something for 10 years now wants to take more of an entry-level position. Well, you know, I want to move closer, my family in the area, or whatever, you know, be truthful, of course, but it's okay to say those things just briefly in the letter. Um, it really helps the search committee, again, to kind of understand the context of what's going on. Um, and then think about what it is that you would like to accomplish in that job. Um, maybe you bring, because of your experience, something really special that you could um, accomplish in that job and, you know, maybe it will resonate with the committee, it might not, but at least you put it out there um, and I think that, that can make um, a real difference in, in your application. And then when you get to the interview, um, you know, again, you're judging them as much as they are judging you and so you can see whether it's, it's going to work out or not. I would also say, uh, talking a little bit from the other side of that as well, I know that there's a lot of people who come into librarianship as their second career, and so you may have a lot of job experience that isn't in a library, and so it can take some time to craft those experiences into something that is still relevant and useful to a library setting. And so I would say, you know, you don't have to leave out jobs that aren't exactly a library job, just 
craft it so that you're saying, look, this was a different job, but I got management skills out of it, or I got information seeking skills out of it, or customer service skills. There's so many different skills that go into what we do that really any job from any other career field has relevant parts. And so make sure that you're, you're hitting and highlighting those as well. And so we have a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to cover the first two in one question, and, and Sam and Beth, you can tackle that. Um, Donna has asked, can you speak to pools? I, I believe that means application pools, but um, I'll let you interpret that. And Jenny asks, what makes an interviewee stand out the most? Wow, OK. Um, I can talk a little bit about pools, what I've been seeing most recently. I'm guessing you're asking about sizes of pools and, and how deep they are. Um, in academic libraries, we are still seeing really large pools for entry-level positions. So for those uh, kind of jobs that don't require a lot of library experience, usually they want some, but not, you know, two or five years. We're talking about a position that would accept, you know, less than two years of full-time experience. We're still seeing large pools, um, 50 to 100. Um, just a couple years ago, when I was at Northern Arizona, we had a couple of entry-level pools that had over 200 applications. Um, so when you're thinking about that, you really um, have to have a top-notch letter and, and CV in order to get an interview. I think at more experienced levels, though, we are not seeing as large a pool. So if we're trying to hire a um, someone who's going to manage a unit in an academic library, um, or you're going to be the access services librarian, and you're going to be perhaps um, supervising six to ten classified staff. Those pools tend to be much smaller. Um, and, and again, it kind of depends on the institution. I think um, school libraries are, are seeing a huge application pools because those jobs are few and far between. Um, I don't know if Sam wants to talk um, a little bit about her experience um, in special libraries, but I think there still is an oversupply of entry-level um, librarians, um, and then it can get better um, with a few years of experience. Is it more Please. awesome? I'm sorry, Sam. Do you want is it more often that they hire for they're, they're um, collecting a pool of people and then they'll hire from that pool or they do it on call and then they'll hire when something is available or do they put another job out there that you also have to apply for? Um, most institutions uh, hire um, based on just one job description. So they don't um, have like an open pool. There are some, um, I think, uh, college and, and universities where they might hire their part-time people via a pool. So you might be a part-time adjunct doing working the reference desk. Um, but if you want a full-time position, typically um, most, in my experience, most colleges and universities um, we post a position, we collect applications for that position, and then it closes, and then we hire just someone out of that one pool. Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe special libraries? Absolutely. Um, from my experience with special libraries, we still get uh, quite a few applicants, especially in the bigger regions. Um, they're hiring right now in uh, the Denver region, and they get just inundated. Um, it's a little bit easier where I live because we're about two hours outside of Denver and like I said it's a small city and so we don't get quite as many applicants. Um, so if you're willing to live in a more rural area then that's definitely something to think about when you're debating pools and things like that. Um, we don't have open pools. We don't necessarily do things like keeping your application on file or anything. It's you're applying for the job that's open. If another one opens up, then you have to apply for that one as well if you want to be considered for both positions. And uh, that actually brought up an interesting point. If there is an institution that you're interested in working at and they have two open positions, there seems to be a lot of questions about can you apply for both? 
And if by applying for both, are you indicating that you're not all that interested in the position in general? And my personal belief, and Beth can maybe speak to her belief on this too, is as long as you can talk about how you want to work for that institution or that group or that team, then you can apply for a couple of different positions that are open at that place of employment. Um, just as long as you can address that passion that you have for that location. And so that's really, I think, what it boils down to when you have multiple positions open at the same place. So I'm hoping that that kind of addressed your question, Donna. I may be misunderstanding the word pool. My understanding of um, collecting a pool of people to draw from um, rather than a pool of people for a particular position. Does that make sense? There's an adjunct, but it seems like it's on call and it's a pool, and it, and it is an academic library, um, community college in this case, and they're, they're collecting a pool of people. And, and I get the impression that it's for on call. Um, could that possibly be the case? Yeah, I'm guessing that this is Beth here. I think what that is is they're probably hiring a number of of part-time people, um, and it might be very few hours a week um, because they're hiring um, quite a few, and so they probably continuously hire, um, and so that's why they call it a pool. They just continuously have the same position open, and so they just are constantly looking at the new applications and, and then deciding whether they're going to interview them. Um, that's something that typically, I think, happens if they have those part-time kind of reference, usually reference um, positions that work the nights and weekends. They call that a pool. Um, what I was referring to is just a, we usually call, if there's one position open, all the applicants that apply for that particular job, we also call that an applicant pool. But that's a very specific application and requires, you know, it's a very specific job that we're trying to fill. Um, I agree with Sam that if there is a position or two positions or even three positions open at a library, if you can write a convincing letter um, and customize the letter, um, I think that is absolutely fine to apply to multiple jobs. Um, I think that sometimes the search committees are different and they won't even know that you applied for multiple jobs, but also um, if you can say, you know, why you want to work for that institution at that moment. Um, and what you bring to that institution, then then you're going to have a good letter. I believe Jeremy had the uh, shared a second question, which was what makes people stand out in the interview day. Um, so I'll just try to respond to that. I think um, preparation really does stand out. Um, so your presentation is is done well and and, and responds to what the committee asks you to do. Um, you are prepared with questions, you um, have researched the institution, and then just I think sometimes it's a little bit of luck. Um, do you happen to just say something that really um, resonates with the committee and, and then you see that at the beginning of the interview day? Um, and what, I, what has always impressed me is if that person then is able to apply that and mention that later on in the day. For instance, they may meet with um, someone at the beginning of the day just to go over what the interview schedule is like. And if you happen to mention, well, we're, we just started, you know, offering these late night hours or whatever. And then if someone later in that, that interview candidate can then apply that to some example later on, I can tell, wow, this person not only is a good listener, but really cares about this particular position and, and um, can, I can just imagine them doing great things um, later on. I don't know if Sam wants to comment on what makes uh, people stand out in an interview. Actually, sorry, before Sam uh, jumps in, we want to quickly, uh, Kate has to run, so we're going to quickly do the drawing and then we're going to come back to the q and I don't want to um, anyone to think we're stopping the Q&A. We have a lot of great questions to cover in the chat, but um, we just wanted to quickly give Kate the opportunity to do the to give away so she can dash. So I apologize for the interruption. But Kate, go ahead and um, announce the winners. Thank you, Jeremy. So out of Donna, Stacy, Linnea, and Jenny, I'm using an online 
uh, random picker app. So the first winner is going to be Stacy. And then we'll go ahead and draw for the second one. So if you could just type your uh, full name again with your email address in the chat box. Marissa will be in touch with you uh, either tonight or tomorrow uh, with information about how to make your membership so. And the second winner for the evening is Linnea. Congratulations, you guys. Um, I, if you have any questions for me at all about your membership, I, I'm the current membership director, and you can reach me at this email address, sjsuassist at gmail.com, with any questions you may have. Um, but Marissa can probably answer all your questions, and she'll take care of you. And welcome to the chapter. OK, great. That, that, thank you so much, everyone, for letting us, uh, letting us do that. Um, I'll go to that later. We'll go back here to the question slide because that's a little bit more palatable. Um, OK, so let's go back. And, and Sam, if you do want to at any point talk about sort of the, what makes an interviewee stand out the most, um, I, we'd love to hear that as well. But um, the next question is, what advice can you give for management level interviews that might differ from other interviews? Well, uh, I'll go ahead and speak just quickly about uh, the standing out question. I would say the research definitely is a big one, um, but also seeming put together. You know, you came in, you had your notepad ready, you had a pen that worked, your outfit looked good, you know, no stains, nothing seemed ill-fitting or anything like that, and a sense of humor. I'm a very humorous person, and I want to know that whoever's going to be joining my team also has a sense of humor. And so I think that those really make someone stand out for me. Um, and then I'm going to let Beth take the uh, manager hiring question. OK, great. Um, I think, uh, depending, again, you know, like all positions, look at what qualities they're looking for um, at the management level. Um, Certainly, many things that you might have done in non-library jobs are going to be of value to the institution. So if you worked in retail or any kind of customer service, um, if you have managed people, supervised people, done budgeting, all of those things, please bring all of those out um, via your resume and your cover letter and make sure that your references are aware of that experience um, because your references may only know your most recent employment. Um, so make sure they understand um, what your level of experience is. I think um, the questions are going to be prob there's probably going to be more questions um, because those positions, um, if you're going to be supervising someone, they, they actually put the institutions at risk. Um, because supervisors have to make a lot of hard decisions. Uh, we want to make sure that people are thoughtful, not only have great experience, but are going to motivate people um, and, frankly, keep the institution out of trouble. So um, anything that you can do to convince um, the committee that um, that you not only have those management skills, but that you've faced challenging situations um, and have come through that um, and learned from that. I think a very common question for management positions is going to be something about, um, tell us when you had to provide a performance review or tell us about your experience um, with performance appraisals or coaching and those kind of things. And so again, have some really good examples um, from your past, and then if you don't have uh, examples where you've had to um, deal with a challenging situation, if you've been really lucky, then say, you know, what training you've gone to so that you're prepared for those situations, because that's probably what they're looking for. They're looking for, can this person handle, um, you know, challenging situations, or have, do they have experience writing those annual appraisals, um, writing job descriptions, hiring student employees, all those things. So again, anticipate what they're looking for and then do your best job to prepare yourself um, and your references um, for, that, for that interview day. 
I hope that got to what you're hoping for. Okay, so um, we have a couple more questions, but I'm actually going to end the recording now. And so if anyone is listening to this and wants the rest of the question and answers, I'm going to post all of them to our um, blog on the SGSU ACIST website. So check there for the rest of the Q&A.